I want to, again, formally introduce myself. My name is Jay Williams. I have the privilege and the opportunity of serving uh, as the president of the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving. Uh, I am here with uh, our talented and passionate staff to uh, engage in uh, a series of listening sessions with each of our 29 communities. And there are a couple of logistical things uh, that I'd like to hit, but before we uh, get started, we'd just like to take a moment to uh, have you watch a video. As I said just a few minutes ago, we are here to uh, engage in a conversation, and as uh, was articulated in the video, we are not just a community foundation, we are your community foundation. The Hartford Foundation for Public Giving has been around, we are in our 93rd year, and we serve 29 communities in the greater Hartford region. And while the name says Hartford Foundation and our offices are in Hartford, it is clear uh, that the relationship and the benefit that we have derived from the generosity uh, from individuals and families uh, from across the 29 community region uh, is why we are able to do what we do. Through the partnerships, uh, through the passionate, uh, talented individuals that we have, and at the end of the day, we are here to serve. And there was a, a commitment that we made back in November at our annual uh, meeting uh, of our donors and stakeholders that uh, we were going to reintroduce ourselves to the community. And as I said, while we've been around for 93 years, uh, we never want to presume that people know who we are or what we do, or more dangerously than that, we don't want to presume that we uh, continue to have our fingers on the pulse of what's going on in our communities simply from the offices uh, that we operate out of or because we're working with our partners throughout the communities. And it was a, an example that I think uh, serves as uh, there was an incident, well, not an incident, there was a, an example that serves as a good uh, a reminder of why we were here. If we can go back, there's the, the, the screen that we were showing just uh, at the opening, uh, the, the title screen. And this was pointed out, and this shows that, again, uh, you know, we still have a lot to learn. Uh, you know, there is a process of, of, of humility that we're going through that I think really speaks to the authenticity of why we want to have uh, these conversations and discussions. This is our fourth or fifth uh, discussion that we've had. We've been to Andover and Marlboro and, Bur and Bolton. Uh, we've been to Vernon. Uh, we've been to Granby and East Granby. We've been to, to Canton. And again, are going to go and engage each of the 29 communities uh, over the course of our region. And the idea is to have you talk to us about how we can be a better partner, how we can address some of the aspirations some of the concerns, some of the issues that are facing each of our communities. And as we are here in Avon, a beautiful community, but even early on in some of the discussions before we got formally started, some of you were sharing with me, you know, why you love the community, some of the great assets that are a part of this community, but also some of the concerns and the challenges. And that's exactly what we want to hear and what we want to discuss. Uh, it's important because we're here to serve. It's important because we are also in the process of putting together our next three-year strategic plan. And that plan needs to be and has to be informed by the issues and the aspirations and the priorities that are amongst the 29 communities that we serve. And there is no better way to do that than to come and have a conversation. Now, this doesn't work. This is a listening session. So I have to do a little bit of talking, but I and the staff really intend to do more listening. We want you to be very candid and frank. We're, you know, we got thick skin. Uh, you know, if there are things we're doing well, that's nice to hear. But more importantly, if there are things that we can do better, or if there are things that we perhaps have not considered, this is a process of reimagining our relationships and all of the things that we do to engage our communities. So the example that I wanted to point out was that as we, uh, you know, do our homework and, and reach out to the communities and, and we go through uh, inviting individuals through a variety of means, through social media, uh, through, you know, email and through, uh, you know, sometimes flyers and through radio and print. How many of you heard of us, uh, heard about the invitation here through social media? How many through word of mouth? Okay. Uh, print media or television? Flyer on a telephone pole? <laughs> doesn't matter how you, it does matter to us, but the point is we want to make sure that we're reaching out to, to, to attract and to invite uh, a wide array of constituents from the town, whether you're one of our nonprofit partners, whether you're just a citizen who's like, I have no idea who you guys are, but I got an invitation. Uh, some of you may have said, hey, I was in the library and I saw something from Onion Kitchen, so I wandered in and, and, and wanted to have a conversation. 
uh, it's important that we have a good representative uh, audience from the community to really speak to the issues of the community. So the example I wanted to point out, it was pointed out to me that as we you know, do the homework and we want to have an invitation that really reflects you know, what's going on in the town and iconic images, that this uh, Avon Cider Mill building, which for, I'm assuming, in many years was, was present in the town and represented one of the iconic scenes in the town, no longer exists. Uh, and it was, you know, it was again, a, a, a very friendly you know, example pointed out to me uh, that it really reflects why we are here. And, and while certainly uh, anyone who has lived in a town is familiar and, 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 and remembers the building, uh, I think it's now I was told it was a correct, it's a correct school on that site, which is you know, another good addition to the community. And while it certainly still is a part of the history of the community, and it certainly is a part of the memory of the community, and while it certainly should still be recognized, and I'm sure it, that image exists in a lot of places, it really speaks to the fact that we want to also make sure that we are in contact with you about what is, what are the issues of today and what are the issues that you're thinking about as a town going forward? Uh, what are the, the concerns? Again, what are the aspirations? What are the things that you enjoy and make Avon uh, a town with a great quality of life that you, you, know, you wish you uh, could continue to hang on to and, and share? Uh, and what are the things that give you pause or give you concern? So again, just a very small example that we can, we can chuckle at, but I think it speaks to the very real authentic conversation we want to have with you uh, and hear from you. So like I said, this doesn't uh, work if I'm the one doing all the talking. So uh, really want to uh, uh, enter into a dialogue and a discussion and, and get this started about, again, how we can be a better partner, how we can help address the issues uh, that, that, that are of concern or, or of interest to you. Where can we make sure that we're aligning our programs and our investments with the priorities of the stakeholders and the citizens here in Avon? So really going to open the floor up. Uh, myself and the staff uh, are, have enjoyed these conversations. And uh, as I was walking in, this was a very uh, robust group. There were lots of conversations going on, and, and that was a good sign. Uh, so you know, we don't expect any shyness now. I, I will tell you that uh, you know, if, if you don't get the conversation started and you make eye contact with me, I will take that as a sign that you have something to say. Even if you haven't raised your hand. But in all of these discussions, in all of these, we are capturing this information. Uh, and this is a part of an ongoing. So this isn't a one and done either, where it's like, oh, okay, we came, we, we heard, we pat ourselves on the back, we checked a box and said, okay, we've got Avon covered. Uh, this is a relationship that endures and will continue to endure, and we want you to see it of value. We want you to see us as we are a regional community foundation. We want you to also see us as your community foundation. So that being the case, I know that there were a couple of things that were already talked about uh, early on that people said they wanted to mention, but Let's, let's have a dialogue. Let's have a conversation about uh, you know, why we're here uh, and where we've been, uh, but more importantly, where we hope to go with you uh, as a partner uh, in the town of Avon. So I'll just open the floor up. Yes, ma'am. I, I live in the town. Good. Excellent. Have, oh, OK. And of course, I have a lot of good things to say about the town, but that's not really why I'm here. Okay. Uh, I'm here because I, I know about your foundation very well. It's well known. Okay. And I have two things that I wanted to bring up. And I think it's an area that I think Avon should be giving more attention to that I would recommend it. And that is the mentally ill persons in the community. And I'm speaking as a member of the Farmington Valley um, NEMI um, Association for the Mentally Ill. We don't have enough. We need to have trained policemen who know how to deal with people who are in a mental illness state. And we need more access into the schools to present the programs that we have that would help. Not, we're not assuming that everybody in school has a mental illness. But we all know they'll probably meet somebody in their lifetime who has a mental illness, and they should know something about it and know how to deal with that person. So that's why I'm here. Thank you very much. So. And you know that does speak to areas uh, as as our priorities currently uh, are education, learning, birth through college, family, economic security, uh, and helping to create vibrant communities. And that is something that is very much within. Uh, the areas of, of focus in our investments, working with partners to, to inform and to educate 
and to provide the support and the training and the resources, as you talked about, for uh, those, whether it's those in law enforcement who will encounter individuals who are uh, dealing and struggling with mental illness. And, and, and we've all seen, unfortunately, too many instances where uh, you know, the end of that interaction resulted in something very tragic uh, you know, with well-intended law enforcement officers, but oftentimes who you know, find themselves uh, you know, in those difficult situations. So to the extent that there's an ability to inform and to educate and to train, uh, through partnerships with, with agencies and organizations such as yourselves uh, are the types of conversation things that we do want to know about, the investments that we do make, and, and, and figuring out how we can provide the appropriate levels of assistance. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, sir. I'm Jonathan Craig from South Dakota. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, I just wanted to know if you could go through the vetting process that uh, an agency would have to go through to get grants because sure. uh, it seems to have changed over the years and I just sure. wanted to update on that. And I appreciate you bringing that up. And that ties into a comment mm. that was made uh, earlier. There was uh, some concern or uh, you know, expressed about the lack of clarity or understanding what that process looks like. Uh, I'm going to ask Judy Rossi Battle, who is uh, Senior Vice President of Community Investments, uh, which is where uh, that is the, the team members who really do uh, the analysis and, 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 and explain the process of how to engage the foundation. Judy? Hello, Judy Rossi Battle, as Jay just said. I think the, the, the easiest thing, I don't want to stand in front of you. I think the easiest thing is just to make a phone call. One of the, that has not changed. Our process is always still that personal connection, and we have an intake process, so that may be new to some. Um, but we have that person sort of does an initial intake, and then internally we have a discussion about how that fits within the priorities. And as Jay said, they're pretty wide open at this point, particularly the vibrant communities. And we will then have a conversation with the agency. If there's questions, you'll be assigned an officer who will follow up with you. Um, so essentially, it's, it's a pretty simple, um, and I think that it is a phone call and connecting personally so that we don't just say no on the phone. And, and I think that's an important point that she said is that our goal is, now, you know, the reality is not we have, you know, finite resources and there are, you know, so many needs and not every uh, uh, proposal is able to be funded, but the approach that we want coming in is to how can we engage in a conversation? that you know, goes through the process of, 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 of looking at the, 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 the proposal itself, the organization, and trying to get to yes. It, it isn't where we want the process to be so grinding that it becomes you know, a determination of trying to keep out as many discussions as we can. And taking that approach does require uh, you know, significant resources because an easier thing would be to do is say, just go to the website, fill this out, you know, it goes into a black box somewhere and someone gets back to you or worse yet, you get sort of an automatic reply that says, thank you, uh, but we're not interested or thank you, we'll get back to you. The importance of having that conversation, because there is information that can be and is put down uh, on an application. We, we need, you know, the, the specifics around it, but having a conversation that provides context, that allows us to, to really understand the needs, understand the organization, understand the proposal beyond what is put uh, you know, into the application itself is important. And while that uh, is not always the most efficient way, you know, it, it was much more efficient just to say put it in and we'll sort of put it through the process. Uh, it's a way that I think that we feel very uh, important about engaging the community in those conversations. And even that being said, to some uh, organizations, it's still somewhat mysterious. It's still somewhat uh, perceived as somewhat difficult. So Judy opened up with pick up the phone. Pick up the phone and call us. And it doesn't even have to be because you're ready to make a formal application. Uh, it could be because you want to have a conversation about a concept. You want to have a conversation to understand how uh, you know, the, the, the priorities that are set forward uh, by the foundation are aligned with the needs of the communities. And that is, again, why we're here. Because while we have priorities that have come from our discussions and engagement with the, found with the communities, things change. Uh, things have changed over the course of the past several decades, but we see that the pace of change has even increased. We know things have changed over the course of the last three years of the strategic plan. Things have changed over the course of the past 12 months. And while we you know, don't want to you know, and aren't going to chase every you know, uh, twist and turn, because we do need to build that continuity, it is important that we do have a very clear understanding 
of the current and the future needs uh, and issues and concerns of our uh, of community. So if nothing else, you know, the website provides lots of information. Uh, some people prefer to do that first and get an understanding of the programs and initiatives. Other people say, oh, that's good, but I'd rather talk to someone about it, and we very much welcome that. So thank you, Judy. Yes. Hi, Susan Purbison. I'm here with Gifts of Love. And I was just going to comment on what you were just talking about. Uh, we have one grant. It's a three-year grant that supports Hartford children coming out to our farm and pairing them with Simsbury and Granby. And then in the fall, we start with pairing them with Avon. Mm -hmm. But that was about a year and a half in making where we came to you with an idea and worked with us until it was funded. And now Katie Martin, who's now a vice president at FoodShare, back when she was working with St. Joseph's, came to you guys with an idea. And now we've just been brought in as partners. But it may not happen overnight, but the nice thing is they're there to coach you and work with you until it happens. It's not just like, no, we don't like that idea. You're out. Um, just extremely helpful is the best I, thing I, I can say about you guys. I appreciate you sharing that because our partners come with varying degrees of, 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 of staff capacity and knowledge and, and, and resources. There are some nonprofits that have you know, a half dozen staffers who are responsible for development, who are responsible for uh, working with foundations and nonprofits and, and, and bring a great deal of experience and time to put at that. Other foundations or other nonprofits, you've got a couple of people who are wearing the hat of you know, executive director and development director, and they're the chief marketing officer and the bottle, you know, they're doing it all. They're administering the programs and trying to keep the lights on. So to that end, that's where not only do we see ourselves as a, a resource of potential, uh, you know, financial resources, uh, but see ourselves as a partner, trying to help build the capacity of our nonprofit partners, whether it's because that conversation or series of conversations that happens with our, uh, our grants officers or other staff members, or it's because you participate, and, and I would make mention of our NSP program, our nonprofit support program, uh, which is a program uh, specifically to help build capacity uh, with our nonprofit partners. We have had a number of small nonprofits who have gotten guidance in terms of board uh, interaction, in terms of technology or, or, or fund development. So more than just saying it's about you know, us funding uh, with the financial resources, we really want to be seen as a as a partner to help you navigate those challenges, uh, to put the proposals together. And, and again, you're right, they don't take, you know, some of them don't happen overnight, many of them happen over a series of conversations and engagements. But at the end of the day, even those uh, that aren't funded, we've had nonprofit organizations say, you know, we, we, we worked with you, we had a series of conversations and ultimately uh, did not pursue funding or the proposal wasn't funded, uh, but they still expressed the value uh, that they got from having the conversation the things that they learned that ultimately may benefit them down the road, whether it's funding with us or just in the service uh, of the, the clients or, or the constituents that they, that they serve. So thank you for, for that. And, and really, that is a credit and a testament to the staff. Uh, I enjoy and, and, you know, my position as president. And I've said, and I continue to say, that uh, the financial resources that we've been afforded, that is a, a very important and a valuable tool. But when it comes to the actual assets of the foundation, uh, our greatest asset are, are those individuals who that you describe, who work and bring their passion, their talent uh, to to our partners throughout the 29 communities. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, John Bourget. Um, Thank you. Want to hear my Elvis impression? <laughs> <laughs> Give me a microphone. Yeah. Watch out. <laughs> This is a quiet group, so I may call on you if they continue to sort of, we're going to come have you do a few numbers, get people, break the ice, warm them up. It's right. a good thing my wife isn't here. She'd be dragging me out there. <laughs> um, I, I just came back from my accountant, and we're talking about taxes and so forth. Uh, the changes in the tax law um, moving from 2018 forward are going to have a direct effect on giving, um, which is going to affect all of the not-for-profits that are out here, as well as yourself. Um, any thoughts, any plans, any strategies for those folks? That's a great question. And I, uh, uh, our Vice President of Development, Deborah uh, Rothstein, is uh, unable to join us this evening. But we have given thought to that. And there is still uh, a lot of debate and discussion 
uh, about where ultimately that will end. There are you know, those who, who are, are, are taking a more uh, a dim view of the fact that it will uh, cause individuals who historically have been very philanthropic to rethink their strategy or not be as philanthropic. Uh, there are, you know, the other side of the coin uh, says that the good portion of those individuals who have been philanthropic, you know, don't do it explicitly for the tax benefit, that that is a, a, a benefit that they certainly enjoy. Uh, but there is the school of thought that they are going to continue in their philanthropic ways. And because it's so early, we're not sure, but that doesn't mean we aren't planning for it. So to that end, uh, you know, Deborah and, and the development team have been giving thought to first how to make sure that we're educating uh, our donors or prospective donors with accurate information. Anytime there's a major change in tax legislation or any legislation, uh, you know, there's always misinformation and there are individuals who prey on the misinformation or try to take advantage of that. So we actually put out a publication uh, in collaboration with some other community foundations that really speaks to you know, what are the potential implications of the tax legislation, uh, what are some of the things that continue to be uh, you know, unchanged, uh, and then what are things that uh, donors or prospective donors could take advantage of. So uh, I would encourage you to contact us, and we're happy to provide that. Uh, free of charge that provides you know, a little bit of, it's not tax advice, but it's just perspective uh, based on some of the experts that are, uh, you know, leading that. And to that end, we think it's important that we also continue to uh, engage and inspire donors in new and different ways. Uh, one of the things that we are very cognizant of the fact is that while we have been fortunate to have individuals who have made us a part of their estate plans, who have made us, uh, you know, beneficiaries of uh, you know, their bequests uh, over the course of the years that we don't want to become complacent. So to the extent that we uh, provide other flexible alternatives that inspire donors, uh, to the extent that we uh, continue to diversify our donor pool and uh, don't want to be seen as, well, you know, that's the foundation that once you get to a certain stage in life and you've got, you know, seven-figure net worth that, you know, at that point, philanthropy or thinking about the Hartford Foundation as a partner uh, is the time to do it. Uh, we are, uh, you know, engaging uh, young donors, uh, philanthropists who, you know, maybe are just getting into the beginning stages of their career uh, and don't have, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars or even tens of thousands of dollars, but who have a few hundred dollars that they want to see put into action, that they want to be connected to their communities. So that's the other thing we're doing is making sure that we are seen as a relevant, uh, you know, efficient way to... Uh, inspire philanthropy for individuals who are very familiar and comfortable with uh, philanthropic giving to other individuals who are new on the scene and say, okay, well, you know, why is the Hartford Foundation relevant to my interests? Uh, it is often talked about, and again, I don't want to you know, paint with a broad brush, but when we talk about the millennial generation uh, and their uh, perspective on uh, philanthropy is uh, somewhat different than previous generations. Uh, not to say that they don't have an interest in you know, building the long-term relationships, but there is a lot of evidence that says they want to see that immediate impact. Uh, they you know, have, a, have a value set that says we appreciate uh, you know, the community uh, and the challenges of the community, and while you know, there isn't a $10,000 fund that we have to start, not, not that they, some of them don't, but you know, what can I do with $500? What can I do with $250? And pool that with others to see immediate impacts in our community. So, those are some of the strategies that we're taking. And as more information comes out, uh, we very much want to be seen as a thought resource uh, and a source of guidance to all of our donors and prospective donors. And part of that is we've been engaging more recently, uh, at least two or three times in the past month or so, uh, the professional uh, financial planners and financial advisors uh, that really have that trusted relationship with our donors. So making sure that we continue to see them as a partner and a resource sharing that information uh, are all things that we're doing. And as time uh, you know, goes on and we get to the end of this year and we see what uh, the giving pattern looks like versus last year, and then even more so after we get a couple of years out, you know, we'll have a better idea of what, what the effects and the impacts are uh, of the legislation that was signed last year. Thanks. Hi, my name is Terry Wilson, and I'm the president of the Avon Historical Society, volunteer. We are a small 501c3 nonprofit, 44 years going. I know a lot of people in this room. 
I'm going to say some good things and I'm going to say some not so good things oh. because not only through the Historical Society but also through in my previous professional life that you knew me as. Um, there's not been some good times with the Hartford Foundation for a lot of reasons, but let me just get to the complimentary pieces first. I'll start out on the positive. First of all, thank you for doing this. When you were, when you were named as the director, I got excited because I said, I know Jay. He did something for me personally, uh, professionally, two years ago in Hartford when you were at the EDA. That was wonderful, and I thought, good. Good leadership, young, bright. Your background with, as mayor of Toledo, Ohio. Youngstown. Man, uh, I'm sorry, Youngstown. That's, that's right. Youngstown, the oh, manufacturing that's piece. That's Mm. All right, I know. Sorry. <laughs> I was born. But the young, in, bright part, the young bright part made up for that. <laughs> so you could have said Chicago or, you know, Port of yeah, yeah, young and bright. You know was, what? I'll yeah. tell you. All right. I was born in Cleveland, lived in Parma before I came I, okay, here. So, so now really, you yeah, see where that comes you. from. Okay, right. that's an inside joke for Ohioans. Anyway, um, but I've been in Connecticut for most of my life, so I call it home. Anyway, the point is, is that um, I was glad you were coming because I was hoping something like this would happen so that those of us who are at the very bottom of the food chain in getting donations and in getting grants can have a voice to speak. Now I say this because I've been in the historical society business for a long time, and um, not just in Avon but in Simsbury as well. And big frustration is Hartford Foundation for Public Giving doesn't listen to the small nonprofits. And I'm sorry to say that. And you all are going to know this because go to the website. You don't support the little historical societies that are doing great things in the town. Now, of course, we're not a social organization. We're not NAMI. We're not trying to, you know, we're not working to save kids. But our mission is just as good as anything. We're touching a lot of people's lives. We are involved in a lot of humanities programming, which is talking about a lot of the issues of today. If it weren't for this library and the Historical Society and the Senior Center in Avon getting grants from the American Library Association and Connecticut Humanities, which by the way, thank you very much for saving some of the Connecticut Humanities last year when they had their issue and you guys infused them with 36000 I think it was. That was great, because you know what? That filtered down to us. We got a $2,000 grant to do a big banner program on a couple of projects, so it, it helped us. It did filter down. But there needs to be a lot more done. And I think the way to do this is to talk to some of us at the bottom of the food chain who don't necessarily fit your criteria, who will never have a diverse board you want, just not going to happen. Who's never going to fit a lot of your big criteria, but need little sums of money. And when I went on your website and looked at some of your family foundations mm -hmm. under the arts and culture, and you do say comma history, there's very little in the history. Mm -hmm. Arts, culture, history always gets lumped together. It's okay the Farmington Valley Arts Center gets a lot of the money in Avon. That's okay. That's wonderful. They're great. But you know what? If I need $10,000 to match a grant that I'm doing with the town to restore our almost 200-year-old um, uh, schoolhouse mm -hmm. to open up as a museum in 2023, which, oh, by the way, that's our plan, and that's why I'm here with the town manager is because uh, it's their property, but we maintain it. I'd like to be able to know that I could go to the Hartford Foundation and say, we're putting in 10 the town might put in some cap funds. We're going to try for a grant from Connecticut Trust. Mm -hmm. We're going to try to lump all this together. Can we work on this? Do I have to go through all this crazy criteria that you guys are requiring on the bigger level, which we did through Beacon when I was doing Hartford Health Works. Right. We worked with you. I went to your classes. I went to your, the what did you call them? The, um, the NSP? Yeah, thank you. Uh, that one, yep. I sat through those on board <clears throat> development. We were going to hire a board development person for that project. So I saw all of that on the professional side, and I sat there thinking, that'll never work for a local historical society. Mm -hmm. But a lot of us are doing great things, and it's not just we're sitting there with old houses and, you know, show, and wearing costumes and doing stuff. We're doing things in the humanities. We're working with the churches on projects. We're working with the town. The libraries are great humanity sources, resources for talking about the issues of today. I mean, you know, we're going to spend this whole summer talking about the Constitution of the United States and the freedom of the press. Mm -hmm because look what it's done in our communities, in our world. And we got a grant from the ALA. I'd like to do more. And I'd love to be able to say to you guys, hey, the library got this grant. We wrote it together. It's $2,000. Can you give us another two? We can double our programming, expand it to a bigger community. But I can't do that because you guys have absolutely no way to make it happen. And I'm just being brutally honest. You're new. You don't know all the history and this stuff. But, but a lot of the staff here probably has heard this before. And I bet you I'm not the only one in your communities in the listening set tours that is saying this. And I, I don't think I'm wrong because it's a frustration we have that you're a big foundation. You're like right. the second or third largest in the country. Right. 
but I can't tap into you. Well, again. And that's a shame, and that's a problem. But thank you for doing oh. this. Food is great. And let's, you know, <laughs> I'll stop talking. Thank you. That, that's exactly why we are here. That's exactly why we want to come to the communities, to the individuals who you know, know us through you know, the fact that we've perhaps provide, provided funding, for those who uh, know us through the frustrating experiences they perhaps have had, for those who you know, want to uh, have a conversation about how, as I said, we can be a better partner. So you know, I, not only are we here, I'm publicly inviting you and others uh, to you know, come and, and have a conversation with us around those issues. And I can tell you, even before we got here, we've already started internal discussions about our process. How do we ensure our process you know, is reflective of the fact that we uh, you know, have to make sure that we you know, are looking at the, 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 the parameters and, and, and doing the due diligence that we need to do. But at the same time, one of the things that I didn't say is the Hartford Foundation also recognizes uh, that we need to take more informed risk. Uh, and the analysis uh, that is necessary for a half million dollar grant uh, is different than the analysis that is necessary for a $5,000 or $2,000 grant. That's not to say that due diligence isn't a part of that, because it is. You know, we have an obligation uh, to, to be a good steward, and we are uh, very proud and going to maintain that stewardship. Uh, we are very proud of our board diversity policy. But that being said, we also understand that diversity in communities, uh, you know, communities are diverse themselves, but diversity in one community isn't the same as diversity in another community. So we have, and this issue did come up at one of our previous meetings, uh, and the woman expressed a similar frustration, and we were able to point out what she was unaware, and, and, and we'll take responsibility for this, she was unaware uh, that there are uh, a number of communities that are, uh, have an exception to that diversity policy because the demographics of the community you know, in terms of the diversity poly, just don't match up. So part of that, again, again, part of that is she had the same reaction. Judy? I do want to say, because I don't want to give out false information. Avon is not ex one of the exempt towns. However, um, it's still a conversation that we can have. And I think, as Jay mentioned, the nonprofit support program helps to develop boards in a number of other areas that there's help needed. Um, I also just wanted to say, because I, I hear your frustration, and Jay's right, things are changing, and I, I just, I, pick up the phone. Just please pick up the phone and call us. Um, there's I so many options. I'd love to share yeah, we're stories. inviting you, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Just have a conversation around the table as to how to make the process better. Yeah, and, and, and then over the last two years, we've done what we call a small agency project, oh. which we have focused on, they may, I'm not sure what your budget is, but things like under $200,000. <laughs> you, you and we have been doing capacity building for two years, giving general operating grants. So it's it's something that's new. So again, something that if you pick up the phone, we might be able to help you there. And again, thank you, Judy. And, and again, that's exactly why, because there's a lot of things that have been in the process of changing that uh, people may be unaware of. There are things that are underway now, and there are things that we perhaps haven't thought of. So to the extent of being able to raise those issues in a form like this, and then follow up with a direct conversation with you know, Judy and her staff and individuals uh, that can either talk, oh, this is in the process, or we didn't think about that, or this is something that we, uh, you know, any of those things we welcome a conversation about. And to her point, and, and I want to be clear, I, wasn't, I don't know which towns are exempted, but the fact that Avon isn't doesn't preclude a conversation from happening. And again, like I said, we're proud of the diversity policy and, and the richness that that brings uh, to uh, our relationship with the organizations. But we don't want it, and we don't think it has to be or should be an impediment for us to be able to engage conversations. Because part of what some organizations have walked away with is a, a better understanding and appreciation of what that diversity policy does from the organizational standpoint. And, and one of the individuals uh, who had raised that with us said, well, you know, I want people uh, to, you know, I, I want a board that I get people who get things done and who understand and contribute. I don't want to have to do it just based on diversity. And, you know, the position was, neither do we. It isn't, they aren't mutually exclusive ideas. Having a divorce board doesn't mean that it doesn't have individuals who want to get things done. So to that extent, you know, we welcome that conversation. Appreciate you sharing that with us. Uh, and, you know, the more we hear that, the more that those types of things, both where we can do better uh, and, and things that we're doing well, helps to really validate that, like I said, this is an ongoing relationship. We've been around. We're in our 93rd year. We are not going anywhere. 
these towns, some of them, you know, are 100 plus years old and have been around. So to the extent that uh, as we move forward in this next strategic plan, as we look introspectively at our processes and our policies, uh, that they are reflective of conversations that we've had with our stakeholders and not simply said, hey, well, it's kind of, you know, if, if, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You don't know if it's not broke, you know, if you're not having those conversations and those assessments from people who are directly impacted by or involved in it. Even outside, the staff does a wonderful job, but you know, we want to make sure that we're getting that very authentic and objective uh, assessment uh, and opinion and observation uh, from our community. So thank you. Thank you. And now we're getting warmed up. <laughs> well, thank you very much for being here, Mr. Jay Williams, president of the Hartford <laughs> Foundation. <laughs> Uh, my name is Marissa, and I just wanted to thank you. I understand that now you've been around for 93 years, and I wanted to thank you for the grant that we received at um, the NAMI far for the NAMI Farmington Valley affiliate here in um, the Farmington Valley for $5,000. So it's our first year, Good. you know, establishing that relationship. And what I wanted to say is that, you know, yeah, you're, we're talking about the word diversity, and I just wanted to say that our board is unique because we are diverse. Our mission is to um, offer support, information, education, and advocacy for family members and individuals living with mental illnesses. I myself have a 27-year-old son who was diagnosed with schizophrenia when he was 17. He was still here in the Avon public schools. Stigma is a really, really tough issue. And so our job is to try, you know, to bring that information of education and to support the families and individuals so that, um, you know, we're able to combat that stigma mm -hmm. and able to move forth. And like um, one of my board members, Francis Pass, had mentioned, you know, getting the word out into our public schools. I mean, I'm sure that's a totally different you know, game altogether, a whole different project, but it's very important. And, you know, so I'm sort of like on the other side. I understand that every time something bad happens, that's what we're left with. But I just want you to know that individuals who live with a mental illness are just like you and I. And they aren't, you know, what we imagine that they are. I have a wonderful, beautiful son. And the reason why I'm involved with the NAMI Farmington Valley Affiliate is because of him and being able to, you know, facilitate a support group in our community or to offer our signature evidence-based program, which is a family-to-family 12-week -family course to family members. You know, they come to us when they're in crisis situation. Right. Right. So I just wanted to thank you very much for, you know, that grant that we received, and I am very happy to begin that partnership with the foundation. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Uh, thank you for coming out, but more importantly, thank you for the work. And, and, and those types of partnerships are exactly what, uh, you know, inspires our staff, uh, you know, inspires our donors, uh, without whom we wouldn't have those financial resources. So thank you. Get your hand up. I just wanted to clarify, I'm Helen Thomas, and I'm here with Carol Kaplan, and we are from the Farming and Valley Arts Center. And I sort of dovetailing in what, what you said, we also struggle with um, grants be, for the very same reasons you so eloquently described. So um, j for those of you that don't know, the Arts Center, um, just down behind the police station in the beautiful brownstone building is uh, over 40 five years old, uh, working artist uh, studios for 20 or so uh, studio artists, uh, providing um, art classes to the community in Avon, from the elderly to um, the, the children. We have great summer arts programs for the kids. Uh, we have a new initiative providing art to members of the community with physical and uh, mental disabilities. Uh, that's a, a new outreach of, of ours. But again, going back to the, the grant issues, we're always struggling for grant money. Uh, for Again, board diversity, we often don't qualify. We're very small. We struggle. I, I was interested in what you were talking about because we struggle with 
uh, funding. We do. We just hired a development director. We do not have currently an executive director, which also impacts some of our abilities to go after certain grants. Mm -hmm. um, and again, this is all feeds into mm -hmm. being able to afford mm -hmm. to 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 do that and to keep the art center going. So I look forward to future discussions and Absolutely. collaborations. And as I uh, offered a, you know, an invitation to Terry, I offer that invitation uh, that if there are in other, in the community, other nonprofits that struggle with that, you know, we invite you all down for a collective conversation so we can have a wide ranging discussion. Obviously there are individual needs you have as organizations, but I think, uh, you know, I would, I would love to, to have a, a, a wider ranging conversation about the frustrations, uh, you know, that some of those not, small nonprofits are having, to talk about where there are areas that are already uh, underway or areas that could be given consideration to do that. Because, you know, we're here to support. We're not here to, to, to say no. We're not here to uh, find out ways to, to not support nonprofits. That is not, uh, you know, mutually exclusive from our uh, obligation to maintain that stewardship and to do the due diligence that we have to do. Uh, so the best way to figure out a path forward that works is through those discussions, through those conversations, and making sure that we uh, make it clear that we welcome those. And that's, that's what we've also heard is sometimes there's a, uh, you know, an unintended mystery behind the process or an unintended mystery behind you know, how to navigate and do you have to have the right connection or the right uh, you know, level of capacity. And that's not the case. You know, picking up a phone, uh, is, is a good thing, but we said even beyond that, it is our obligation to come to the community, to, to have a discussion and a conversation, to ask questions of how we can be more impactful, what can we do to be a better partner, and, and, you know, and as a result of that, uh, you know, we appreciate you all sharing that and, and, and very much welcome you know, that discussion about, about those issues. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name's Valerie Wiseman. Um, we've lived in Avon 26 years, three, three boys who went through the public schools. Um, we have a son, Glenn, who has an intellectual disability who's serviced by the Farmington Valley ARC. And I wanna say thank you because I know um, they've been the beneficiary of some grants, which um, as we all know, the state is in a state and <laughs> the, the direct staff that service people like Glenn haven't had a raise in, right. since 2007. But putting that aside, um, Favar is doing a lot of great things, um, innovative things um, with um, smart technology and their housing project. They're building a life education center. These are all things that depend on, you know, donations. Right. They're not coming, like I said, from the state of Connecticut. Right. Um, but what that allows Favar to do is to really improve the quality of life for um, people like my son Glenn right. and a number of other people who live in the Farmington Valley. So I just want to say thank you and hopefully we will continue that relationship. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So today, today is Tuesday. So on either Friday, uh, Stephen, uh, Steve Morris, uh, the president of Favar was in my office, uh, and we were having a conversation about those very things. About the uh, w one, we were just thrilled to hear about the I dash, uh, the the integrated uh, communities that they are, you know, talking about, uh, and these happen to be in Bloomfield and in Canton, uh, talking about the technology that they are using, you know, in their uh, residential, uh, you know, developments and trying to find ways to partner with them uh, because again, the innovative approach that they are taking. And, and some of the things they're talking about uh, don't exist anywhere in the state or the country. I mean, some of the programs, initiatives they're moving forward with are cutting edge. So the fact that that's happening you know, in the Farmington Valley, the fact that uh, we want to figure out how to be a partner. So his passion, the work that he was doing, uh, was evident, so we certainly appreciate you. You, you, you know, you didn't know he and I were having that discussion two days ago. So this is not a setup. It was like, oh, that's so convenient. Yeah, uh, but just and 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 he and I and and and, and some of the staff members. Uh, so that relationship that we have with them that has been longstanding uh, will certainly continue, and we're looking for ways to even build on the success. So thank you for bringing that, Linda. Piggyback on what my fellow board member just said. 
Valerie. I'm here on behalf of Trevor, but I'm also here on behalf of Avon. We have lived here for 12 years and have absolutely loved it. I will say to you, um, if you're worried about your taxes, vote with your feet on November. <laughs> okay. I, and that is because, pretty much, I see everybody is a Republican around here. And that's, that's, not true. that's not necessarily true, and that's right. And the fact of the matter is, as I look at that, one of the things that we are seeing are very white kinds of things. White children in, their, in our high schools and in our middle schools, white kids in the private schools, and we have not done the diversity that we need to do because everyone, NAMI, an art center, favor, they bring us a new way of thinking about ourselves. And I think that it's very important that we begin to say, not them and us, but I and thou. So that um, I think that the stretch for Avon now is to bring people in of color, bring people in in diverse places, housing that allows people to come here, and give it a chance that we might have more diversity, more love, more openness, and more caring for, for all of us. Because when we help one, then the rest of us are helped also. And we become not, you're not from Avon, are you? You're, you're not. And when I first moved here, it was, I was horrified because one of my people said to me that I was working with, oh, you live in Avon. That's where when the African Americans go across the hill, they're picked up. And I have seen it. I sat in Nassau Park lot for a while. It's not, we've addressed it, I think. But the fact of the matter is, is that we really need to bring Favar with housing for disabled kids. I have a grandson who is um, very bright and, and is in West Hartford and autism, he has autism. He's coming up on that time for when we, um, the state has no more time for it at 21. We need to build places that people can afford and we can be not just that community over the hill from that Hartford. Thank you. And again, as a regional community foundation, we represent and, and serve uh, the 29 communities with an array of uh, you know, diversity and challenges. And one of the things that has been a, a common thread was is been that while people love their communities, we've also heard repeatedly in virtually every one of the conversations we've heard the citizens uh, you know, talk about being connected to the broader region. Uh, when we were in Granby and East Granby a couple of weeks ago, uh, loved the community, talked about you know, the uh, agricultural heritage, talked about the quality of life, uh, but two or three of the uh, residents stood up, uh, both, and this was Granby, East Granby and also in Canton, stood up and said, you know, we love our town, but we also are concerned about the region. We want to you know, ensure that we are connected to the region. And they specifically, uh, one couple pointed out, uh, and they said on, on 44, if we get up and, and turn right on Route 44, we're down in Hartford enjoying, you know, all the quality of life and amenities there on Hartford. And if we you know, go the other way on 44, we're out in Canton where we can enjoy, you know, the things that that community has to offer. Uh, but they use that example of, you know, Route 44 uh, connects, you know, the, the, the core uh, and the most challenging parts of the city of Hartford uh, with the uh, communities that are, 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 are along that corridor. So to the extent that we have a role and an obligation to each of the individual communities, but we also have a role to the broader region and to the issue to the extent that uh, those are aspirations or priorities uh, of those communities uh, we are very much here to help facilitate that and be a partner in that thank you very much 
I just wanted to follow up on some of Linda's con comments. Um, since I've been at the Science Center, we've driven vans down into the projects that were projects and no longer are. Um, we got funding from Harvard Foundation to do that. It made our diversity a new uh, way of looking at things, and we were able to help kids, and the kids responded in a positive way. And I think if we think of our, our children that are coming up through the classes at Avon and through all the different schools, uh, diversity is a very important issue. Kids do not see color. Right. They, they see other kids that are interested in the same things. And that's what we find in our academy, and that's what we find when we bring the kids in for the summer programs, thanks to your funding. And uh, I also wanted to comment on your support programs. Um, we have a diverse board to as much as we can, yeah, yeah. and we're, we're meeting the criteria, mm -hmm. but those board members, we didn't recruit them from Avon, we recruited them from all over different parts mm -hmm. of the state because they're interested in education. So I think the, those people that are working with local agencies, whether it's arts, I'm sure you can find diverse members of the art community that would want to be a member of an Avon board. So those kinds of things, I think, are ways that you can overcome some of the issues that you're bringing up, uh, us to realize as an agency. Um, Thank and you. I think that's, that, that's, that's a helpful. great point, that, 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 that the <coughs> board members, uh, you know, there is no requirement that the board members, uh, you know, have to come from, you know, that particular town. So when we look at diversity, and let me say that, Within the Hartford Foundation, uh, as we speak right now, in fact, yesterday, uh, you know, we had a, 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 a half-day session with the entire leadership team on the issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, to make sure that those issues aren't just terms that are in our uh, mission statement or are reflected on the values on our wall, which they are. When you walk into the office of the Hartford Foundation, you see our set of values, and, and one of those values has diversity, equity, inclusion. But it's not enough just to have it on the wall uh, and to say, well, yeah, hey, look at it. We walk past it every day. What does it mean in terms of how we uh, treat each other within the foundation? What does it mean with how we go about doing our work? So before you know, we apply that lens to any of our external relationships, you know, it is something that we want to make sure that is genuine and authentic. And, 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 and what does it mean and the richness that, that it adds? Uh, and understanding the diversity, go, uh, people often, I'm not suggesting anyone in here doing it, is doing it, but people often just think diversity, they automatically go to race. And while that's a part of it, diversity goes well beyond that. I mean, diversity, as you all know, goes well beyond that. That's a, a, an important uh, construct and concept, but diversity uh, is, is deeper and wider uh, than what is often seen or heard or talked about in those short sound bites. So you brought up a great point that there are uh, individuals within the arts community uh, that are, are, are very diverse that may not happen to reside uh, in Avon that would love to be able to offer their time uh, and their talent and the things that they could add to the richness of the discussion or of the organization. So uh, thank you for raising that, that as you, as you look at uh, building diverse organizations and diverse boards, you know, you know, sometimes it does require you yeah, looking beyond sort of the immediacy of the community which may not be all that diverse, and, and that's neither here nor there at the moment, but looking, how can we bring those individuals and attract them? Uh, there are a lot of individuals who are, who are eager to do that, so thank you for, for raising that. Yeah. Hi, I'm Ann Fitzgerald. I'm on the board of the Avon Library, uh, which is not why I'm here. I'm here because I'm interested. And I have had a conversation with uh, Deborah Rothstein about my own personal situation, which leads me to, John, your comment about the um, uh, lack of charitable donations being able to be written off next year or this year. And uh, for those of you who are 70 and a half or older, you are able to donate from your uh, 401k or IRAs um, through charitable... Uh, Qualified charitable donation or qualified charitable distribution. I'm not quite sure what the D is. But it lowers your uh, adjusted gross income, but you are not able to uh, write it off as a deduction, which we probably will not be able to do anyway. So you do get the saving of um, a lower adjusted gross income. Um, now, I just lost my train of thought. What were we just talking about? Who was, who was just talking John, yeah. Oh, diversity, John. thank you. The um, leadership greater Hartford, uh, 
<laughs> has board training and uh, offers training to those who are interested in joining boards of directors and um, will then link you with anywhere in the state of Connecticut with someone who might be interested. So you might want to contact Leadership Greater Hartford to, yeah, to let them know that you're interested in board members from outside of Avon. And then the, another thing that I was interested in and with our town manager here, Brandon, you might be able to help me, um, the bicycle trail, you know, the rail to trail, who is responsible for maintaining that? We are, the town is, okay. Ra rails to trail. Okay. All right, so I am, I am a user of the rail to trail. And I know that outside of Avon, they are trying to um, fill a nine mile gap in Plainville, Cheshire, down that way. And I didn't know if that was something that uh, Hartford Foundation would be interested in funding it, a vibrant community uh, through the um, Farmington Valley Trail Council, right? So that issue has come up in some of the other communities. And, and our response uh, to them Thank was, you. If this is uh, a priority of that community, we would welcome uh, an opportunity to discuss with them, uh, you know, how we might find a, a way to appropriately fund that. Some of the, and I don't know exactly where the trails go, so some of it obviously may run outside of our jurisdiction. But for those uh, towns and communities that do have uh, the trail running through their jurisdiction, that identify that as a priority or something that adds to the quality of life, and we've heard just that, uh, we've invited them to have that conversation. Uh, we are also, you know, uh, talking to uh, the communities about ways that we, you know, might support uh, and work with them to create mechanisms for them to uh, fund some of these projects themselves in ways that we might ultimately seed, uh, you know, a, a, a fund within the community uh, that the communities then can use to attract additional resources, that they can use to leverage resources. So yeah, that came up, and I think that one was when we were out in um, uh, Andover and Hebron and Bolton, uh, the issue of the trails came up, and, and they identify that as something that adds to the quality of life that is a priority. So uh, that's a conversation we are going to have with them, both uh, in terms of are there prospects to uh, you know, support it through our traditional programs, or you know, is there an opportunity for uh, at the end of this process that they have resources that come as a result of these conversations that, that they can support it. So I would say the same thing uh, to the group here in Avon. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Susan Purbison again from Gifts of Love. Um, one quick thing on the uh, greater leadership of Hartford is you don't have to go through training they train people, they have a whole list of people that are looking for a board to be on, and once a quarter they do, I call it speed dating, but it's speed interviewing, and so then you can interview them and then you get to walk away with three candidates that you would like to learn more about, and it's $90, and it saves you a lot of time from going out and finding and interviewing people. So, so. we have, we, 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 I, I wanna say stole, but you know, we, we are friendly. <laughs> we have a former uh, leadership, uh, Greater Hartford, uh, staff member who has now joined us. At so I know she's been itching to talk about this. So, oh. Karen, oh, I, I, I was going to say something. Oh, can I can I finish before oh, I go? That I just sorry. wanted to say on the diversity topic, um, what we are faced with is the lack of awareness of economic diversity here in Farmington Valley. Um, there is a big stigma if you need help in the Farmington Valley and in Avon. And um, it really was brought to light last spring when I got a phone call from a social worker at the high school saying that after working with this gentleman for five months where he wasn't eating so his younger brothers and sisters could eat, finally gave her permission to make the phone call right. and ask for help. But we get so many people that they don't want to come in. They don't want to be seen, seen coming through eating. our doors right. because right. you can't live in Avon and be someone that needs help. Right. And our population, we're one of only two organizations in the state that solely work 
with working people who cannot meet their needs. Right. They're what make up the Alice report. Mm -hmm. And that is 30% of Avon. Right. And people don't realize it. It's one out of six in the Farmington Valley right. make up the Alice report where they do not have a living wage and they have to make tough choices every day. Right. So that's a big diversity here that isn't recognized. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, let me address the, the Leadership Greater Hartford program. It's called Leaders on Board. And um, there is a sliding scale for, um, for a cost for a contribution for a nonprofit, depending on the size of the nonprofit. There is a board orientation training for free for individuals once a month. And once a month, there's an express match, which is the speed dating model. So it happens monthly, except in the summer. Um, the Leadership Greater Hartford website is a leadershipgh.org. The program is called Leaders on Board, and the program director is Mae Maloney, and that also, like the foundation, just make a phone call, pick up the phone. She'll be happy to talk to you. Thank you. So we've got a few more minutes. Oh, you're just grabbing the mic. I'm sorry. <laughs> An ambassador, um, an ambassador group, mm -hmm. as part of your sort of advisors. Um, have you looked at that, um, and maybe a subcommittee of that, to be community liaisons? Have 29 of them. Right. Um, does that? There's quite a number of people on there. Do you have representation from each town? That is a great point. I believe we. That is the goal. Uh, is to have our board of ambassadors have representatives from each of the 29 towns. So we are close. I don't know if are all 29. Represented. Looking at staff. <laughs> our board of ambassadors. Our goal is to have board of ambassadors that represent each of our 29 towns. I know we are close. Are all 29 towns represented on the board of ambassadors yet? Not necessarily, but I think ultimately that is the goal. Right. This okay. is only year two of okay. the board of ambassadors, but I think that's a great idea to have that type of representation. Yeah. And, our, our, and, and if you're not familiar, our board of so we have our board of directors, uh, you know, that have the fiduciary responsibility for the uh, Hartford uh, Foundation for Public Giving. There are, uh, you know, currently nine board members out of 11 spots, but the board of ambassadors are individuals who uh, are members of the communities, uh, you know, come from various backgrounds and professions and, pers and, and perspectives that really, again, help to, as you talked about, serve as those liaisons. Uh, to give us a, a sense of what's going on in, in each of those communities. And uh, as Francesca, I actually forgot, I'm, I'm new myself, eight months in. So this program is only a couple of years old, but the goal is to have each of those uh, communities represented. And to your point of then having a subset of those uh, ambassadors to, to talk to us and uh, represent the, the, the foundation, uh, to represent the voice uh, of, of, of those communities and, and, and stakeholders within those communities. Uh, as another effort to ensure that we don't fall victim of the ivory tower syndrome. And that's, that's easy to do uh, you know, in a philanthropic world because when you're working and you're giving out grants and you're, you're doing good work and people say, oh, it's great work, and you know, you're looking and, and millions and millions of dollars are going out, it's easy if we're not cautious, cognizant about it to, to fall into that syndrome of, of hearing the echo chamber of, okay, well, we you know, typically deal with you know, these, these nonprofit groups and they're doing great work. And what happens is some of the frustration uh, you know, that you talked about are those individuals or those groups or organizations that have not had a relationship with us find it difficult to sort of break through that. So that, I think, through having a board of ambassadors, from having these types of discussions, uh, from you know, looking at our processes, we want to be very uh, seen, not just seen, but to be felt and experienced as very transparent, to be very accessible. And that doesn't mean that you know, everyone who uh, seeks funding from the foundation, every organization gets it, uh, but every organization should feel that there was a legitimate, substantive conversation uh, about the proposals or about the aspirations or about those ideas. Uh, and whether they walk away uh, ultimately funded or not, we want to be seen as a, as a valuable resource. And uh, a number of organizations said that they learned more just from the conversation than just from the process uh, than they would have otherwise expected, you know, whether they were ultimately funded or not. So that Board of Ambassadors is a, 
a, a great tool and a great asset and a great group of individuals who, again, volunteer their time uh, and their talent and their perspective to help us really you know, remain connected to the community in every way that we can. No, it's not one filter. No, no. By, by no means is it. Yeah, it's it. Oh, no, 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 no. This is just a, a, another another point of contact. So, yeah, by all means, uh, you know, inquiries or discussions need not go through that ambassador. It's just a, an opportunity for us to have a person who is connected to that community who can give us unsolicited perspective and, and, and ideas who we gather the board of ambassadors together a few times a year. But it doesn't stop an organization from picking up the phone and say, well, I appreciate, you know, John Smith is, our is, is the ambassador to Avon, but we'd like to have a conversation about these issues with the foundation itself. So by all means. Maybe you have time for one more? Oh, there are, before, there are cards on your chair that if uh, you, hopefully, I, hopefully it's not because you weren't comfortable talking. I mean, I think we've, been, we've established a good rapport here. Uh, but if you weren't comfortable or there's an issue that you didn't raise or, or, or forgot, if you would uh, fill out uh, the card. And, and again, it, it, it asks the questions of what do you love about your town? What makes it a great place to live? What can make it uh, better or stronger? What needs does the town have? How can we be a better partner? So uh, even take it with you because if something strikes you uh, on your way home or tomorrow or later on, uh, we uh, find these of great value. And as I said in the beginning, uh, we are in the process of thinking about our next strategic plan. And that plan, uh, while the board has set a broad vision and direction, uh, what we are responsible for doing and what is essential to that plan is that it is very much informed by discussions and, 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 and debate and that we're having with, with the communities that we serve. So if you would uh, you know, take this with you, even if you've had a discussion tonight uh, and raise your issues, uh, and put that in the mail, and, and we're happy to, to incorporate that into our dialogue. And what's also going to happen is that, as I said, this isn't a one-off, that we are capturing this, uh, uh, staff taking notes and capturing it on video, so we can go back and, and synthesize it and, and, and then come back uh, or, or make sure we convey back to you what we've heard to make sure it's accurate, uh, that we understood uh, what was discussed and what was raised this evening, because there are going to be uh, obviously, ongoing conversations and meetings and discussions that some of you have uh, about your organizations or our process. Uh, and there are going to be broader things that arise later on uh, as a part of this. Uh, but we're going to you know, reach back out and, and really talk about how to have, uh, make sure there's a lasting legacy, something tangible. You spent uh, you know, a couple of hours with us by the time you, you, you know, left wherever you were earlier in the afternoon and came here and made your way here. Uh, we've had fruitful conversation, but we want to ensure that after we go through this process uh, through the rest of these uh, months of the year, uh, that we come back to you with something of value, something substantial that really reflects, oh, they did hear us. They weren't just here to have a conversation, check that box. They heard what we said, and that as a result of us giving our time and our discussion with them, you know, we have something of value to our community. So that's very important to us that we do that. And it doesn't stop there. That's just you know, I, I think a reflection of the appreciation we have for you engaging in this conversation, but that really is a part of the ongoing conversations uh, and relationships that we'll have with these communities going forward. So thank you all for your time, for your passion, uh, for the authenticity, for the candid and frank discussion. Uh, that's why we're here, and, and, and the fact that you all offer that to us is of significant value. I want to thank the staff for, uh, you know, their time and their talent and, and, and being here. Uh, and for all of the individuals who, without whom, uh, you know, Stephanie, you and your team, the logistics of putting these things together, you know, my job is show up and run my mouth up front and do a lot of listening. They, the hard work of finding the place and making sure all the other things, uh, you know, is, is something I don't want to take for granted. So please, there's more Onion Kitchen. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening, and thank you all very much. Thank you. All right.